Well, then I will start. I mean, it's telling me that we're now streaming live. So welcome, everybody. This is the um, Tuesday, August 25th session from the House General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. Uh, we are uh, meeting for the first time since June, since the end of June. It's been two months. I hope everybody's harvesting and freezing and putting up their um their stuff if we were in person next january i will share with you my roasted tomatillo salsa all grown from the garden um but uh that's kind of a cheap offer because we don't know if we're going to be back in the building at all next year so or how we're going to do that so um and representative kamash is now joining us welcome back um we are Going to um, Representative Kamash, hello. Um, we are going to, um, as I was mentioning before we went on the air, we have quite a tight schedule in the next month for just even the limited amount of work that we have in front of us. And it's, I say limited, but um, we will be getting a lot of pressure from advocates on their priorities. Um, all good bills that, uh, that that people have been spending quite a bit of time over the biennium working for. And if this were a normal circumstance at the end of the biennium, we would be um, in the building for quite a long time for weeks on end trying to finish up this work. We don't have that luxury moving forward this month. And so um, what I'm interested in at first is um, your well-being. Um, where are you in terms of, are there any things that are standing out for you? Did you have a good break? Um, are there things that are going to um, preclude you from being able to participate fully or, you know, in a, in, you know, in a distracted way? Um, I certainly want to be accommodating to people's work schedules and life schedules. Um, I think I put into an email that if you do have things that stand out, please let us know. I also want to um, acknowledge that under this world of unprecedented events, we are doing business smack dab in the middle of what's going to be a, 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 an election season. And I really want us to try to build a wall if we can. Um, everything we do is political, obviously. Um, but I just want to acknowledge publicly that there are, you know, that, that many of us have races and are anxious to try to deal with that. Um, but my focus really and the committee's focus really has to remain on finishing up the business that we signed up to do for Vermonters. And, and I know that that's kind of not going to be easy and there's going to be some tempers that might flare. It is the end of the biennium. Um, but just know that that's something that um, I know that I'm aware of, and if you need to chat with me at any time, feel free to call to, to talk through things that you may see. But we have limited amounts of time on Zoom, and it feels, now that we're beginning again, it feels a lot more limited to me than, it, than I thought it might back at the end of June. Um, so with that, before I get into, um, before we get into the bills, um, specifically S-237 um, in front of us. Does anyone have um, any, I don't know, what did you do this summer uh, reports? Representative Gonzalez. Um, uh, more housekeeping question actually in terms of our committee schedule and if it will be um, as it was last time where we would know at the end of the week, what our schedule is the next week, or if um, like the house session that, or the uh, um, the floor session that the speaker put out of that will have start times, even if we don't have end times for, for the house. So wondering if what has been figured out, if anything about that. I just received yesterday the draft schedule for next week, which for us would be very similar times. Uh, I do believe that the um, – I did, haven't looked at it closely enough to know when the floor times were going to be scheduled, but I think the, the, the general feeling is, is that this week and next week will be fairly light floor. Um, but that said, uh, for instance, we're still pushing to see if we can get recovery residences off the, off the big wall and over to the Senate. Um, 
and they of course have bills that uh, they of course have bills in the same condition. So uh, the short answer is yes, we should have the schedule by the end of the week. Um, I may have the schedule as soon as tomorrow. Um, it's being, it's, uh, it was shared with the chairs and um, I believe it'll be issued officially um, as soon as tomorrow or Thursday. So um, welcome Senator Sorokin. We're just doing um, a meet and greet here. Um, and um, anyone else on, I know that, um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to um, deprive anyone if they have news or if they, again, if they have known, known um, roadblocks ahead to, to share. If not, then um, we can just go on and, and hopefully catch up over time. Last week, was it last week already that there was a meeting of the Appropriations Committee that our committee was invited to. Several of us were able to attend. Um, it was an Appropriations Meeting Committee on the military budget. And in that meeting, we basically talked, um, the, the thing that we need to deal with by the end of today with respect to that, even though we're meeting with the military tomorrow, is um, specifically the, the Appropriations Committee is inviting committees to participate in conversations about, um, about our portfolio when they meet with people, in this case, the Guard, on the budget presentations that were being done and proposed by the administration. Those of us who were there heard that there was very little change in the military budget. The, the, the Appropriations Committee is seeking not so much a full budget memo, but sort of a written acknowledgement that we know what the, what the proposal is and that we support it or don't as they move forward. They are on a very expedited schedule in terms of getting the budget done. Um, most, I think all of us who were there last week nodded our heads yes, that the changes that were being proposed were sufficient and, and were not detrimental to the Guard's mission um, as we understand it. Uh, there was language that will be presented tomorrow on the scholarship language. Um, there's an issue with the scholarship language uh, in that we made these scholarships contingent on a student going through basic training prior to receiving them. And um, people can't go to basic training now, right now. And so the question was, will there be language that would allow um, that to happen? So we'll, cons we'll see what that is. Representative Fagan's been working on that as a, as a special, um, that he, he's very concerned about it. Um, so we'll hear the updated language that they're proposing tomorrow on that. On the other news from the military budget, they're returning money, I think, and I think this goes to the work that you did last biennium with the understanding that once a scholarship begins, it's going to take several years to ramp it up to being taken fully. Um, but they are returning some of the funds at this point in time, simply because um, the, their expectations, their, their expectations have actually been met, but this is considered surplus uh, money for this particular year. They don't want to lose their budgetary line that they're that they received, but they were returning funds that they weren't able to use, um, almost specifically because of the way that they're ramping up their um, the scholarship program. So, the um, the guard will be able to explain a little bit more about that tomorrow. So, but but we we either by I would say I would say actually by tomorrow afternoon we need to let the appropriations committee know. And each time we hear something, um, if we are we are attend, we are invited to attend the VHCB hearing at three thirty this afternoon, um, and it will be the same thing. We will be active participants in the um, conversation. If um, if we if we had comments, it would be a joint hearing between appropriations and us. Uh, any questions so far? Sorry, I'm highly caffeinated today. Um, so is the committee, do you want the committee chair to be at the 3.30 meeting? If you can make it, if your schedule allows. Um, okay. We will certainly, um, re if there's questions, uh, I believe the I believe the administration has 
taken as their as their um, immediate presentation or proposal is uh, they didn't change the what they presented in January as much as they are representing that with some changes based on what's happened with CRF money in different areas um, with uh, I think upwards of a three percent dip in the in the appropriation and I don't I don't know if Emily if you have um, any further insight into what they've proposed but really it's it's been um, I don't want to say it's simple um, but it's it, that's as simple as I think I can phrase it is that there's basically a three percent drop in in the, in the January proposal is that did I get that right okay and did we get that invitation from Ron to attend this Zoom meeting? Um, we should have received it as a committee on Sunday night, possibly from Teresa Utten, from uh, Teresa, Chairman. Okay. okay thank and, you. And um, and if we didn't, if if by the end of today's meeting people say they didn't receive that that email, then um, we can ask for it to be sent out again. There right. was an update that was sent out today, as I recall. Just um, clarifying, I think that it's at 3.30 for VHCB is the plan. Um, so, uh, and that's going to be for the overall budget. We will have VHCB in later this week to give us an update, which they provided the, an August 15th memo of their work with the, um, with the $32 million that we had allocated to them for capital purchases. Um, and we'll have further details about the housing um, programs. Uh, we, they've been stood up um, like everything else we did in May and June. Um, it, the work was pretty remarkable, but it wasn't perfect. And I think we'll hear from different people over the next week or so um, questions about whether we can tighten up the programs that we stood up um, and some of the issues that came up um, but I don't want to. I want to. I want to give full shrift to S two thirty seven for the rest of today. Um, S two thirty. Let me see. Let me just check my list. This is no. That's what I had on my list. Um, just to welcome us back with. And um, so I just wanted to introduce S two thirty seven by way of um, very short introduction on my part, and then ask Senator Sorotkin to um, start the testimony to explain it. This is, uh, in on the Senate side, this was a bill that started last summer after the session. Um, it started out with conversations with stakeholders. And it also, up until sometime in June, um, it included quite a bit of Act 250 language, um, which was similar to the language that we were working on on our side in a different committee. Um, my impression of this bill long, you know, back in, back in March and April was that this primarily would be uh, uh, in the Natural Resources Committee, the, the committee that, that was working on Act 250. Um, but it, it, because that language was stripped out, we ended up being assigned the bill because now it's, while it's zoning, it's primarily a housing uh, bill. So this has been something that's been a high priority of, of Senator Sorokin uh, through the work uh, that's being done since the summer. And I just wanted to give him the opportunity to introduce the bill and um, you know, let us know um, in conjunction with a lot of the material that I shared with you in the last week or so on this, um, what the Senate's take on this bill is, what the prognosis was um, starting with the bill and, and um, and what do we have in front of us? And then we'll hear from uh, then we'll hear from uh, Josh Hanford and Jacob Hemrick are here, and then the attorney um, Ellen Sajowski is here to walk us through the bill. And um, and as we know, again with the end of the biennium, um, this is a time where we may consider other housing bills that are floating out in the world. Um, there's a bill that somehow got over to Human Services. S-187 that we'll talk about in the future. Um, and certainly we had another housing bill, H-739, that, that, that many of us felt was a priority that we'd want to consider. But that's for further conversation. Um, today's strictly about 237. 
So with that, um, Senator Sorokin, welcome to House General. Uh, thank you, Representative Stevens. I am going to be very brief because I promised my committee that I would be back in 10 minutes. And I think I've already passed that uh, time frame. Um, so yes, you're correct. This is a bill that uh, S-237 um, passed the Senate unanimously on a 30 to nothing uh, vote. Um, and it is primarily concerned with uh, land use planning uh, policies that could promote greater density in housing in appropriate locations throughout the state. I had the privilege of being employed by two giants in this area, uh, um, John Ewing and Paul Brun, uh, both of who are uh, legacies, uh, legends, I should say, dealing with smart growth in the state of Vermont. And it's an issue that's near and dear to uh, my heart. And um, we had ventured out of the state house last summer. Uh, we did hearings all around the state of Vermont um, and about how to promote more affordable housing and workforce housing uh, in the state. And one of the things we consistently heard was that um, uh, it's not all about money. You know, everybody has their hand out for more money to make housing more affordable, but there are certain policies that you could promote that could reduce the cost of developing that housing and especially in uh, neighborhood development areas and designated downtowns. Uh, while we were doing that, the administration was uh, doing their homework and doing research upon what several Western states had done. And I would encourage you, I heard your list of witnesses, but I would also encourage you, uh, maybe Josh is gonna speak for Chris, but Chris Cochran was very instrumental in our work on this particular legislation. So I encourage you to hear from him as well. But uh, I'm not gonna go into the nitty gritty, but there are many policies here, mostly in the nature of carrots, uh, uh, to try and incentivize uh, communities that um, are areas where we would like to see smart growth to um, promote the uh, uh, density, greater density in those areas and uh, to make housing more affordable as a result of, um, of those policy changes. Um, we have already, as I think I may have mentioned to some of you, We've already started to see on a national level, some of the leaders in land use planning uh, coming forth and saying, hailing uh, uh, S-237 as a, a major piece of legislation in the right direction. Uh, I'm gonna stop there because I really need to get back, but I, I wanna say one thing that our committee has done and it's in conjunction with conversations I've had with Representative Stevens that both of us have been very concerned with uh, getting a registry of housing rental units in the state of Vermont, as well as getting a more professional code enforcement process going. And we passed a bill two years ago that kept that momentum going. We sent a, a commission out to come back with recommendations. And it was the understanding between Representative Stevens and I that the house would work on those provisions. And so long and short of it, I hope you add those to 237. And I've got to run. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And um, we will be, um, I'm sure you'll be aware of when we're taking this bill up. And so, you know, please follow and, and um, we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Sorry, Thanks. I have to run. All right, um, I'd like to pop over to uh, uh, Commissioner Hanford, if that's possible. Um, Commissioner Hanford, your your house has changed. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm actually in the office today, an empty office. Um, I have all afternoon Zoom meetings and I have a house full of, 
I have my kids and it's several friends over, so it was just not a place to <laughs> to work today. They so, call that uh, school, don't they? Isn't that school? Yeah, I guess so. It's summer school or some sort. But uh, I'm happy that they're enjoying summer, and um, this was nice to be able to retreat to the office. So um, thanks for having me this morning. Um, I think it's still morning. Um, I hope everyone's had a, a enjoyable summer, at least as much as you, you can. Um, certainly been sunny and warm, but um, I, I've just got a couple comments that I can make on this um, bill, and then Jacob's going to kind of run through some details, or maybe you'll have Ellen go through the different sections first. I, I'm not sure, but um, my um, you know main sort of points I wanted to get across is that you know one section of this bill, section two, currently as it's um, in in the bill you know, the administration is opposed to it at this point. Um, we have been working with the League of Cities and Towns and uh, that, uh, Vermont Planners Association. They have expressed real concerns with that section, uh, particularly section 2B, the sort of inclusive development requirements. Um, we're hoping that there is some compromise, some um, changes that can get everyone to yes. Um, but until that happens, um, we're, we're, we're holding out our full support for that section um, of the bill. It just, you know, they represent hundreds of towns and they all have their different views on this. And it's it sort of, you know, um, is a forced hand in a way that uh, maybe could be more of an incentive based approach that the actual goals are pretty much universally supported, but each community might need to take a different approach to get there you know, such as the recommendations in the Zoning for Great Neighborhoods um, uh, study and, and, and uh, process we went through. You know, we did do a large stakeholder outreach um, over last summer um, to talk about this and engage lots of folks. Um, but that is the one sticking point um, that uh, I'm hopeful we'll, we'll get to a compromise so there can be full support behind it. The other two elements are minor, but we need to express that they are not necessary and are unneeded and that's there's two studies in the bill um, one that requires a study of age specific housing senior housing and another for short-term rentals um, i can send to the committee um, uh, recent studies that um, show that this, this work's already been done we you know we funded a five-year housing study you know it cost 50 50 million uh, fifty thousand dollars last year which looks extensively into all aspects of housing, including senior housing. Um, we paid extra to pay for short-term rental data and have that spelled out in there. Any new study in the, this area, you know, it, it, from our perspective feels redundant and would actually have to have a budget associated with it. Um, we paid extra for the short-term rental data. And the only way to get more data is to continue to pay um, for that source um, data from the various vendors out there that are tracking all of that. And so those two studies do not seem necessary from our point. And I'll, I'll post um, or, or send to Ron the studies and, and sort of the summaries on these two areas that have already been conducted for folks to look at and see if that sort of meets the goals um, as um, were intended in, in the bill as it's written now. So uh, happy to take any any questions now or have Jacob dive into, you know, the, the details, um, whatever you prefer. Um, just, I just, I'll just have one question for uh, Chip. Uh, will you be proposing or will VLCT or will the people who, have, who, who are opposed to section 2B, um, has there been work done to provide what that um, you know? What that compromise could be, and I say that because and our committee does not know what Section Two B exactly is yet, and so I don't want to, I don't want to like jump all the way over it. But I want to just take you know, we know that there are some communities that have been upset by it, um, or that are that want to see a change. But I guess my question is: in the intervening two months, has there been? a conversation where there is where where the there's been a meeting of the minds on this 
there's been a number of conversations um, with the league and, and also the league and Vermont Planners Association uh, meeting and discussing, trying to figure out what a compromise was be, would be. I don't have language in my hand. Um, you know, there are a few areas maybe um, when you get into the details of this around a, uh, a sort of opt out provision for a municipality that um, maybe the language around that being softened or any perceived penalties to a community being softened is one possibility I've heard. Um, you know, there might be real reasons why a community can't sort of demand um, this inclusive development and they, they don't want to be penalized for doing other good growth in their community or, or housing. Um, you know, I'm sure folks maybe have heard from Chip Sawyer from St. Albans and, you know, that's a community that's added 200 housing units just in the last um, five years or so in, in their growth center and their TIF district. Um, you know, they're one of the communities that is vocal on this sort of um, what they would describe as one size fits all. Um, I think I think there's a, a path forward that we can get to with everyone a yes on this. And that, that's my hope. But I don't want to speak for the league or um, Vermont Planners Association on exactly what would satisfy their concerns. Okay, thank you. Representative Triano, then Hengo. Um, thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, and good to see you again, Josh. So, you know, I was at a meeting last Saturday and um, a local realtor um, uh, uh, spoke about um, the, in the last four or five months, uh, the um, explosion of, um, of uh, property purchases in Ver within Vermont. Um, and um, she was uh, very concerned about affordability because um, properties are changing hands with a sight unseen at this point. Uh, some people that are trying to get away from urban areas and places where uh, hotspots uh, for COVID. Um, so I guess I share some of her concerns with um, the impact of affordability on all properties in Vermont as a result of this um, explosion of, uh, of uh, real, to, real estate sales. Um, and um, I know for, as a lister in my town, um, every sale that has happened since April 1st has been at least $10,000 over the appraised value of the, uh, uh, of the property. And it's actually uh, posing a problem with our CLA um, and will likely uh, cause us to have, to have a reappraisal. They will kind of do anyway, but so the impacts kind of like cascade down um, on, um, you know, people trying to uh, purchase or rent properties, uh, towns that are si trying to keep their CLAs intact and so on. So um, I just I just felt like I needed to bring that up because studies from last year really are not covering something that happened in the last four months. Uh, very good point. And, you know, I, th I think, um this housing needs assessment um, doesn't necessarily try to match up units to units. It just talks about what we need going forward based on our demographics, our household size, our, our, our shrinking household size is really what's driving it. You know, we have more one and two family households, which need, which means we need more housing that's affordable, um, less incomes coming in, not that our population, our permanent residency population is exploding, but, um, to your points, uh, you know, I've been on a number of calls with different realtors and, and, and um, sort of workshops talking about this and a couple interesting things are happening. You know, one, the higher end housing market, you know, the million dollar plus homes have seen about a 300% increase in sales. You know, a lot of those were sitting on the market for over a year in the past and they're selling like crazy right now. Um, you know, so that necessarily doesn't directly impact the, the more affordable homes. But the other flip side is there's less homes going on the market. So there's less inventory. So it's driving up the cost. And that's been explained because people are scared to move right now. They might not be able to get into the house they want to buy. And they might not be able to sell that. You know, so people are foregoing their normal listing and moving right now because of COVID and are just staying put. So they've seen something like a 30 or 40 percent reduction in, in the number of new housing stock going on the market. So it's a double, there's not a, enough to even sell because it's not being put on the market. And that, that is available is selling faster because there's less availability. And a lot of folks from out of state are buying it as a second home or to move here permanently. And they're seeing the most dramatic increase in sales on the high end of the market 
there's no doubt that there'll be as time goes on, if, if this keeps up some impact on affordable homes, but it is very interesting when you dive into the, the data behind what's going on in home sales right now, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty nuanced. Well, that's really interesting. The, the million dollar piece, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, there'll be some good money coming into the property transfer tax. So that, that's a win. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, I, you know, they, they assess that uh, only about 30% of the people who have purchased property in the past four months will actually be permanent residents in Vermont. And I've heard yep. that as well. So it, and also, an you know, on another note on this sort of the, the concern of, of, lots of short-term rentals, vacation homes. There's also some stress in that market. I was just on a call with someone this morning with another legislator, her, uh, her constituent, you know, that folks that have these properties, they're actually not able to use them as intended right now. The whole winter ski season home is in complete jeopardy because who's going to rent a season long home for the winter that they have to quarantine every weekend when they come up and they have to certify. So they can't operate in, you know, with the value in mind in the past. And so some of that sort of um, appeal is also wearing off. So there's a lot changing right now and how permanent this is, or is it just a blip is what everyone's wondering. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I, it, it appears that it could be a blip uh, for sure. Um, and it could settle down, um, but um, interesting piece, thanks. Representative Hango, and then Kalaki. Thank you. I just want to um, address our chair's um, comments about uh, a solution, a possible solution to this. So back at the beginning of the month, we received a flurry of information that probably got buried because we got so much information about this bill from different sources. Um, I really want to direct people that there are some amendments, possible language floating around out there, and um, also some commentary from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns and the Regional Planning Commissions. And we will be hearing from both of those groups, as well as hopefully the city of St. Albans, who has some, has some objections to the language in this bill and has offered some solutions to it that maybe we can move forward with a consensus on. So I really want to make sure everybody digs back through the information that's come to us in the off session, as short as it was. Um, and I appreciate if anybody has any questions to reach out to me because I've been um, in communication with our local St. Albans um, representatives and senators on this. Thanks. Go ahead, John. Uh, thank you. Uh, Josh, I do look forward to reading those reports and, and becoming more familiar with some of the issues. Uh, I'm in South Burlington and our city council did have inclusionary development. Uh, and uh, the, the good side of it is it saved the sprawl that's happening in South Burlington. And we have the O'Brien Farms development that is going up and there is gonna be affordable housing in that mix. And I think it's a really great example of how it works to integrate and to build a there there for a community and stop the kind of overall sprawl and have mixed incomes living in sort of the centers of this. So I think there's an upside to this. I, at least I, I eager to, to hear these other issues you're bringing up, but um, it, it seems to be really working. It made people very nervous in South Burlington and it's really working. I think, and everybody's seen the success of this kind of inclusionary development. So um, I wanna make sure you know, we look at this um, for the health of our communities and the future of Vermont to have affordable housing in our mix. So I hope we can all come up with the solutions that are right. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, John and Lisa and Chip. Um, so Jacob, I'm going to ask Ellen to do a walkthrough first. Um, and the one of the things, um, Josh, I don't, I don't know. Um, I started reading the uh, hard copy of the um, housing book um, the, the, that you sent um, or that was sent out. I think we have access to the electronic copy. And um, 
someone who remained nameless said, you know, re before I started reading, it was like, no, you know, you should read it. It's, it doesn't put you to sleep immediately. And, um, which was a pretty backhanded, um, compliment, but I wanted to say to the committee, it is, it is, yeah, that, there you go. Thank you, Jacob. Um, and, and in fact, uh, I appreciated the editing. You have pictures from Winooski Street in Waterbury and not my house. So thank you. Um, uh, as, as, you know, examples of other houses, which are, which are properly cited. Uh, so the committee just, it's, it's, it's a resource that I think if there is this, um, a solution to this, there are elements that are discussed within this report itself that may lead us to some, um, to some solutions to the, to the issues that are going to be raised. So that's going to be an important resource. And that was developed not only with the consultants, but with, with the department, with Jacob and Josh and, and others within the department too. So I think that's going to um, be a real, if we can, if we can use that as real homework um, in context of what we're going to learn from Ellen today, I think that would be really helpful. Um, so Ellen, um, please, it's, um, this is a long bill, um, and again, we have not seen it. I mean, I've, it's been shared with the committee, but if you could just take us through it and perhaps give us the context of the material that stayed in. I know that there is this, this is actually an excision from a larger bill, uh, um, or that there is a large amount of material excised from this bill, but if you could just, um, take us through the bill and, and really give us an idea of what we're talking about here, um, that would be very helpful. Sure. Uh, Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Counsel. S-237 is on your committee page for today. It is, I'll put it on the screen now. So um, this bill uh, is an act relating to promoting affordable housing. There are a lot of different sections in it. Um, I handled the bulk of it related primarily to municipal zoning, um, but the later sections uh, starting on page 15 were drafted by David Hall. So hopefully you'll hear from him um, later, but I'll start with the zoning pieces and um, that does lar they do largely relate to what you were just discussing with the commissioner. So section one, we're in title 24, 4382. This is the section that lists the requirements for a town plan. So first, the first change, so town plans shall include the following, a utility and facility plan consisting of a map, and so we're adding language in the middle of this paragraph to require on the map water supply lines, facilities, and service areas, and sewage disposal lines, facilities, and service areas. So we're, we're teasing out what else needs to be included on the map within the town plan. Uh, at the top of page two on the next page, another small change in the, the town plan, uh, the municipal plan section. So we're, we're striking the reference and, and changing it slightly here. So um, also required as part of a town plan, a housing element and including a recommended program for addressing low and moderate income persons housing needs. And so the current reference is to 4412. So the program currently shall uh, account for accessory dwelling units in 4412, but we're changing that reference to say, the program shall comply with the requirements of 4412 of this title to provide affordable housing. So we're just making it slightly more broad because um, we make a number of, set of changes in section 4412 and this is the, the section that the commissioner just alluded to, the section two inclusive development requirements. So small change there in the town plan section. And then now we're gonna get into section two. Um, 
Ellen, before you go into section two, which which we've heard is 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 the um, is the one section so far that needs our focus. When it comes to the sewer lines and the water lines, can you do, is that is that mapping out existing lines or is that mapping out historical lines? Is that what, what is that clarifying? Uh, it's present and prospective. So. Um, there was some testimony that some of the towns don't even have their sewer lines mapped. And so those are important. So it's present and perspective should be included in the map. Okay, thank you. Okay, so section two. So this section we're in title 24 and these are uh, required land developments that apply in every municipality. So first, bylaws shall designate appropriate districts and reasonable regulations for multi-unit and multi-family dwellings. No bylaw shall have the effect of excluding these multi-unit or multi-family dwellings from the municipality. Within any regulatory district that allows multi-unit residential dwellings, no bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting multi-unit residential dwellings of four or fewer units as an allowed permitted use or of conditioning approval based on the character of the area. So in a district that allows multi-unit dwellings, the town can't, you must allow at least four units um, you can't uh, prohibit it based on the character of the area. And so uh, this entire, Title 24 is an odd title and this uh, section specifically is a little confusing because the language is sort of structured. Um, no bylaw shall have the effect of is, is kind of a, an odd phrase that's used throughout. So um, please stop me if it's a little, if anyone's confused. Um, but here we have character of the area. You can't use character of the area to prevent four units in a multi-unit district. Your representative Hango. Thank you. I just want to clarify for um, purposes of you know, living in a city that has some lovely old Victorian homes or whatnot, that any of those homes could under this, um, under this new statute be made into apartments or have a dwelling attached to it or built in the driveway as long as the total number of units on that property are four or under, is that correct? So um, there are a lot of variables that could come into play in the scenario you just described. So um, the next, um, on the next page, we're gonna talk about accessory dwelling units, which is um, you know, when you carve out a small piece of a home to have a, a smaller unit, either part of the home or directly adjacent to the home. Um, we're talking here when you have a, um, a zoning district that specifically allows for multi-units. Um, you can't say that four units doesn't fit in the character of the area. Um, you can prevent more than four, um, but up to four should be allowed if it's a multi-unit zoning district. So my question on that is if it's, um, you know, like a really pretty historic district and um, they've already decided, the town has already decided that a beautiful old home could be divided in half, for instance, but someone under this new statute wants to divide those two in half as well and make apartments totaling four in that home that supersede that would supersede what the town has already decided for their quote unquote historical district um so this isn't um necessarily 
project specific. This is requiring that the town can't, within their district, can't enact a bylaw based on the care saying four units doesn't fit in the character of this area. So I'm guessing then a town couldn't say two units or less under this new statute. Um, if it's a multi-unit, yes, I, yes, I will also say, I think the wording here is a little confusing, um, because it really, the last few words of this section are important, it's character of the area, um, because there could be some other potentially limiting factors like, um, wastewater capacity or something that may prevent, um, more than four units or more than, you know, less than four units. So um, if a district is going to allow multi-unit, they can't say that the character of the area doesn't allow for four units. So I guess that's to my point that the aesthetics of it would not be an allowable exception to this statute. Yes. Thank you. Okay. okay. Representative Walls had a question. Yeah, thank you. I actually had two questions and you may have just answered the first one. I was trying to be clear on what the character of the area meant and whether that could not only apply to as Representative Hango was referring to uh, an historic area, you know, you've got these beautiful old Victorian homes and if that's part of the character of the area and also whether that could refer to the capacity. And, and to, uh, I think to wastewater or sewage capacity. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm, my first question is what, what is the definition of character of the area? What does that include? Um, I don't, I don't have it in front of me. I'll need to look it up. Um, it does relate to aesthetics. So, um, I, I don't have a, a specific answer. I, I can look it up for you. I, I appreciate knowing what that, how broad that is and what that includes. My second question is, I, I'm, I'm checking in on this. I assume this would apply to new construction as well as rehabbing existing buildings? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. And we're talking, we're talking about a municipality establishing bylaws. Um, so we're not quite into individual projects. We're saying a municipality can't enact bylaws that would prohibit these things. Okay. If we go through this this whole section, is this whole section D, what it's saying is that is that there needs to be bylaws to appropriate districts. Is that appropriate districts can be are those downtown districts? Are those um, are those areas that uh, are those state sponsored districts or are these just personal districts within a particular community that does not have a designated uh, area? Because um, it's saying that the, the bylaws must shall designate appropriate districts. So, so we're going to say, okay, in this section of Main Street, we can have multi unit family dwellings, which is kind of um, in the but but those bylaws um, shall not have the effect of excluding the dwellings. Um, from the municipality. I mean, so, so those two things just sort of are, are those those first two sentences are those repetitive. Um, and then it says, and then the additional language to me is saying that within that district that's already been created, you shall not create a bylaw that prohibits uh, units that are four or fewer. Um, and then and then based on the character of the area. So it's, it's a pretty loaded, it's a pretty loaded paragraph there. I'm just, if we can work on getting that straightened out in what that means, um, 
not sure. necessarily today. That would be great. Sure. So, um, right, we're not talking about designated um, downtowns or any of the, the designations a town may apply for. What we're talking here are uh, zoning districts. So the first two sentences are slightly redundant. We're saying here, you cannot prevent, you can't, your town can't establish that this town is single family dwellings only. You must allow multi-unit dwellings. And you can put them in specific zoning districts if you don't want them throughout the whole town. You can, you can locate them in specific districts. Um, but the second sentence says, you can't fully exclude multi-unit dwellings from your municipality. Okay, Representative Hengo. Thank you. Um, so what I am getting out of this is that even if a municipality has already decided to allow multi, multiple units um, in this district, for instance, an old, large old home that's been divided into two apartments, that municipality cannot say then that they can only limit it to Two family, a two family dwelling, it has to be, the limit has to be raised to a four household unit. Yeah. It cannot remain a two household unit, even if it was um, zoned as such. So in, in my understanding of this, it is taking the zoning away from the municipality and putting it at our level, at the state level. And we're saying to towns that you need to allow four units or less. Nothing, it really doesn't say anything about single family units because the town has already decided in their zoning that they do not have to remain single family units. Am I correct? Can I, can I go to, um, actually, can I take a pause here and go to Jacob? Um, and Jacob, can you clarify the interpretation of, of the statute here, of what we're talking about here? I, I think the scenario that Representative Hango is describing, uh, as I read this line, uh, would be the case depending upon the interpretation of multi unit, um, which is not defined in this, uh, in Chapter 117 in the Planning Act, um, but it does have some interactions with um, other other use terms, uh, zoning use terms. Um, and for instance, a duplex is uh, distinctly uh, defined. So I think it comes down to what's the definition of multi-unit and how is, how is how, how our attorney is gonna interpret that. Um, uh, but the, uh, the, real, um, the real basis behind this, at least from the administration, which uh, supports a voluntary approach, um, was the character of the area is often a very loose discretionary standard um, that uh, is used as a basis um, for uh, NIMBY appeals and um, how, how can that be narrowed um, so, that, uh, so that instead of a really loose test of what's in character, that there are more clear standards. And that could be you know, a historic preservation district. It could be a form-based code. There are lots of other tools to, um, to regulate to make sure that what is built is in character um, without having kind of a, um, a squishy test. Is that helpful, Chair Stevens? Yeah, I mean, it's... It's you use the magic phrase, of course, which is it depends. Um, but I, I think that when as we keep, I do want to move on from this language. And obviously, this is section two, and I want to flag it because we're going to return to it until we get it understood. Um, Chairman, can I just mention one quick again, character here? the area if, if it's not defined? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, um, Commissioner. So, you know. This one section, I think, is less controversial than some down below in that, you know, this is getting at, you know, municipalities all have to have some sort of area zone for multifamily, you know, to allow 
other than single family homes in their entire community. They can't do that now. That's against fair housing law. You have to allow multifamily. So within those zones, we're setting some standards here that, okay, you can't appeal it. It, um, it has to at least allow four units and you can't appeal it just on the character of the area. You know, that that is used so many times to stop projects um, that, um, are needed in a community because it's, 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 it is ambiguous and you can't define it. As long as you can get enough neighbors to not to, to believe that it's changing the character, it, it stops the project in its tracks, even in an area that's already designated for multifamily. So you're not getting the benefits of that multifamily district if people can't build more multifamily units. Um, is, is kind of what this is trying to get at. Maybe it's not the best way, but that's how I in, interpret it. And it's some of the other provisions farther down that the mandatory inclusive development that more of the, the, the planning community has concerns with. Um, that's my understanding that it's not so much this one first piece here. All right. And, and, and so committee, if we could actually just let, let's go with, Again, I appreciate everybody jumping right in and, and getting into the nitty gritty of this, but let's try to get through, um, let Ellen get through this presentation um, and and then we, and just keep marking the sections where we need clarification. And we know section two or elements of section two have already been brought up as question, as, as areas that we need to, we need to um, look at closely. So Ellen, um, please go right ahead. Okay, so uh, next on page three. So uh, this is the, we're about to talk about the definition of an accessory dwelling unit. So except for uh, flood hazard and fluvial erosion area bylaws, no bylaw shall have the effect of excluding as a permitted use one accessory dwelling unit that is located within or appurtenant to a single family dwelling on an owner occupied lot. So that first change right there, um, we changed that it had to be an owner occupied dwelling to an owner occupied lot. Um, next, a bylaw may require a single family dwelling with an accessory dwelling unit to be subject to the same review dimensional or other controls as required for single family dwelling without an accessory dwelling unit. An accessory dwelling unit means a distinct unit that is clearly subordinate to a single family dwelling and has facilities and provisions for independent living, including sleeping, food preparation, sanitation, provided there is compliance with all of the following. The property has sufficient wastewater capacity, and the unit does not exceed 30% of the total habitable floor, space, floor area of the single family dwelling, or 900 square feet, whichever is greater. So there's a couple of changes here. Um, currently under statute, a, an ADU can only be a studio or a one bedroom apartment. So we struck that and it's now just reads a distinct unit. And also we've um, essentially raised the, the size. So the unit does not exceed 30% of the total habitable floor space or 900 square feet, whichever is greater. Um, so we ch so those are ch these are the changes now to the definition of accessory dwelling unit. Okay. So then on the next page, we- Hold on, but, that's, oh, uh, that, but that language that you just struck, uh, sorry, little, yes. little three is pretty important too, yep. I would imagine. Right, so yes, we're also striking, um, this is a requirement. So provided there's compliance with, and we struck the language applicable setbacks, coverage and parking requirements specified in the bylaws. <clears throat> Representative Hango. So um, the parking requirements, I saw some chatter about that. And somewhere in here, it, it specifies that the dwelling needs to be within a half 
mile of a transit center or something to that effect. Um, I, I really um, don't know that that's feasible in a lot of our smaller municipalities. Even if there is a transit center, it's not really taking people anywhere. Um, like for instance, the city of St. Albans has an Amtrak station. The Amtrak train runs once a day. And um, right now it's not even running because of the uh, COVID restrictions. So um, parking is a problem. You know, I know we've all seen Victorians or, or uh, colonial homes built way back and they have nice beautiful lots and somebody's paved over part of the lot and made a parking lot for the tenants that are living there and there are many cars in the driveway or out on the street so what was the does anybody know what the rationale behind striking parking requirements is and and i'm sorry lisa i'm just going to interrupt i just we will get to that answer, I think, as we move along. As uh, you know, you are a, a probably the most, you probably had the most um, uh, experience with this bill and with opposition to this through the St. Albans connections. And um, I'm hoping to get through, through this so that we can, so that the whole committee can understand what's going on with the bill and then come back to that question because it's a, it's an incredibly important question. I mean, the, the parking requirements is incredibly important, but I would like to try to get the committee to hear the whole bill um, before we get to before we get to that nuance, which again is is well worth uh, delving into. Is that okay? Certainly. Yeah, thank you. thanks. No, thank you. All right, Ellen, please continue. Sure, we'll hear more about parking in a moment. Um, so, all right, so then, yes, we did strike that language. Um, next, so nothing in this subdivision that we just talked about shall be construed to prohibit a bylaw that is less restrictive of ADUs. So a municipality is free to be, um, to have more relaxed standards for ADUs or a bylaw that regulates short-term rental units distinctly from residential units. Um, so we struck language and then we added new language. So uh, we struck language related to ADUs and then added new language that references that now a municipality can regulate short-term rental units distinctly from residential rental units. And there is further language clarifying this later in section 18 and 19 we're um, just 19. So um, we're striking some language related to ADUs and then further clarifying language related to short-term rental units. Um, next, existing small lots. So a municipality may prohibit development of a lot not served and able to connect to municipal sewer and water service if the following applies. The lot is less than one acre in area or the lot has a width, a width or depth dimension of less than 40 feet. So this change, so currently municipalities can prevent development on small lots, but this change is saying that they can only prevent development on small lots if they're unable to um, connect to municipal water and sewer. And then we get into the notorious inclusive development section. So um, we're on the top of page five, except in a municipality that has reported substantial municipal constraints. Uh, and we will talk about that later on in this section. Um, this is the sort of opt out of everything I'm about to tell you, but uh, and notwithstanding any existing bylaw other than flood, flood hazard or fluvial erosion area bylaws, the following land development provisions shall apply <clears throat> in every municipality. <clears throat> <clears throat> throat> 
No bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting the creation of residential lots of at least 10,890 square feet or one quarter acre within any regulatory district that allows residential uses served by and able to connect to a water system operated by the municipality. <clears throat> or, <clears throat> excuse me, 5,400 square feet or one eighth acre within any regulatory district allowing residential uses served by and able to connect to water and sewer operated by the municipality. <clears throat> <clears throat> so a municipality can't prevent residential lots of one quarter acre if there's water or one eighth acre if there's water and sewer. The appropriate municipal panel or administrative officer as applicable shall condition any subdivision approval on obtaining a state wastewater permit pursuant to 10 VSA chapter 64. No bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting or requiring conditional use approval for a two unit dwelling on any lot within any regulatory district allowing residential uses served by and able to connect to a water and sewer system operated by a municipality to any greater extent then a one unit dwelling would be prohibited or restricted in any district with no additional review, dimensional or other controls than would be required for a single family dwelling without a second unit. Uh, that was a lot of words. So we're, we're primarily talking about a, two, a, a duplex here. So if there is water and sewer, um, a municipality can't, um, uh, condition or require additional um, approval for duplexes than they would a single family dwelling. And then D, this is the parking um, stuff that Representative Hango was just referring to. When a bylaw establishes a parking minimum for residential properties, each residential parking space that will be leased separately from residential units shall count as two spaces for purposes of meeting the parking minimum <clears throat> for any proposed development with it located within a half mile of a transit stop. <clears throat> so if, if there is a required parking minimum and the uh, property is located within a, a half mile of the transit stop, and if the parking spaces are going to be leased separately from the residential unit, they can count double towards meeting the parking minimum. The parking space lease costs shall be reasonably proportional to the production, operation, and maintenance cost of the space to reduce generalized subsidy of leased spaces by other residents. A municipality may condition the municipal land permit on continuation of separate leasing of parking spaces and residential units. All right, so those four things were the uh, provisions of the inclusive, the inclusive development provisions. Um, uh, Chair, may I ask a question about that? You may. Uh, Ellen, how does the ADA um, factor in here for parking units if one of the tenants is disabled? Um, I don't know the specific answer. I'm, I'm not that familiar with the ADA. I can tell you that the aim of this is to, uh, many towns do have parking minimums when uh, new residential units are created. Uh, this is talking about if you lease the space separately from the apartment as opposed to including it or, or the unit, it can count double if you're near a transit stop. So if you're um, if a person is intending, you know, potentially to use the transit stop and does not want their, uh, the space, they don't have to lease it. Um, I don't know if Jake has anything to add to that. 
I can I can jump in. The Division of Fire Safety regula- uh, oversees the um, uh, Americans with Disability Act parking requirements. I believe if you have to provide parking, or if you provide parking, there's uh, some threshold that triggers uh, an ADA space. Um, so I, I don't think this would have any impact to that. Um, but certainly somebody could do a, a, a housing project with no parking as is, as is being done. I, I can think of a 17 unit building in Hartford, for instance, um, that uh, is on an eighth acre lot and has no parking. Um, and, and in that case, I don't believe there would have to be the provision of an ADA space. Okay, thank you. Jacob, while we have you, um, so, so I don't live in a town where we lease spaces. Um, almost all of the rental units, at least I'll say downtown where I live, are they come with a parking lot or they come with a, a, a space. Where do we do this? Where where are there separately leased spaces? And, and is that is this contemplating something that's kind of new or is this something that's more urban than, than rural? Um, I, I'm not familiar with leased parking spaces in Vermont anyway. Chicago, yes, but, um, but here I haven't heard of it. Yeah, I, I, my understanding um, is that unbundling the cost of parking spaces is uh, uh, not new. Um, but is not uh, very typical in, in Vermont in, in part because um, we have many parking minimums um, and parking is generally somewhat affordable. Um, the background for unbundling parking spaces is really about uh, should somebody, uh, a tenant of a residential um, building have to pay for a parking space that they don't need or want. And if unbundling reduces the cost in their monthly rent check um, uh, for ha- for parking that they don't need or want, is that a good thing for Vermonters? And and so in, to go back to the beginning of this, is this for new construction or is this for renovating? I mean, if I wanted to renovate my house, would I, you know, offer a space for lease? Um, or is this is this for new construction? Yeah, I'm trying to scan up here and I realize um, I, I believe it would only apply in the event that somebody would be pulling a, a zoning permit either to, it could be new development or the redevelopment of an existing site. So like changing a single family home into a four bedroom unit or four apartment unit. Okay. Chairman Stevens, there are several housing projects that I'm aware of that do lease space from municipality. The New Avenue in St. Johnsbury uses part of a municipal lot. Um, I believe one of the projects in development in, Har- in um, Hardwick would use a municipal lot. So this this um, is in practice in Vermont now. Um, and, and I think the intent here is just if units can be built, um, but there isn't space for parking, should we let the developer and the people that will live there that may or may not have a car decide whether it's a marketable place to build without its own parking is really what we're talking about. Because right now, the parking often is what kills a project in a downtown area. There just isn't a place to build to, to provide that parking. Sure. And so the project doesn't happen. But in several new projects we've seen, they've provided no parking and the projects have filled up like that. Um, and so should it be something that is a choice, a market choice, whether it's needed or not? Um, okay, and this is again, I mean, if you're gonna be a half a mile from a, from a transit stop, your chances are you're gonna be downtown, I think is, is, is the assumption here. Um, and I know it's dangerous to assume, but I think that's, that's the focus here. All right, thank you, Ellen. Or John, did you have a question or are you done? All right, um, Ellen. Okay, so those are the, uh, the four um, inclusive development uh, pieces. Um, so then next, a municipality may opt out of these requirements of subdivision one by filing a substantial municipal constraint report with the Department of Housing and Community Development. The substantial municipal constraint report shall demonstrate that 
The municipality's bylaws comply with all of the requirements of subsection A of this section, and the municipality has documented substantial municipal constraints on its municipal water, municipal sewer, or other services that prevent the adoption of the bylaws that conform to the requirements of subdivision B of this, um, of this uh, subdivision one of the subsection B. So uh, sub subdivision one of subsection B are those four things. And so if the municipality uh, has too many constraints, they can file the report with the department and not have to comply with those four things. On or before January 1st, 2021, the Department of Housing and Community Development shall provide a template and guidance on the form and content of the substantial municipal constraint report. The Department of Housing and Community Development shall post all substantial municipal constraint reports on the department's website and shall promptly provide a copy to the municipality's regional planning commission, the state program directors for municipal water and sewer funding, the Vermont Community Development Board, the Vermont Downtown Development Board, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, and the Natural Resources Board, as well as any person requesting notice. Any person may provide comment on the municipality's report to the Commissioner of Housing and Development within 60 days of the filing. The department shall post all comments on the report, uh, comments with the report on the department's website. <clears throat> a municipality that has filed a substantial municipal constraint report shall update the report each time it updates its municipal plan or bylaws. Failure to update the report shall disqualify the municipality from the incentives identified in subdivision three of this subsection B and may subject the municipality to review by the Commissioner of Housing and Community Development pursuant to 4351 of this title. <clears throat> incentives and funding. On or before July 1, 2021, any municipality that requests technical assistance from the Regional Planning Commission to update local bylaws to address the inclusionary growth as described in subdivision one of this subsection shall receive priority technical assistance through additional funding made available to the applicable Regional Planning Commission by section 4306 of this title or municipal funding made available through the Municipal Planning Grant Program established in 4306 of this title and may use resources developed by the department to assist with the updates. So municipalities that wanna do this can uh, request technical assistance from the regional planning commissions to update their bylaws. And the following state funding programs shall prioritize funding in municipalities that have updated their bylaws to comply with this subsection or are actively pursuing actions that will bring their bylaws into compliance with this section state funding for municipal water and sewer systems, municipal planning grants under 4306 of this title, Vermont Community Development Program under 10 BSA chapter 29 subchapter one, and the neighborhood development area tax credit, a historic tax credits under 32 BSA 5930CC. <clears throat> so municipalities that uh, adopt bylaws to comply with the inclusive development uh, provisions, have access to these incentives, which are prioritized, <clears throat> they're prioritized funding under these programs. There is this additional incentive, which is subdivision four, <clears throat> pursuant to 27 VSA 545, which is the next section we're about to talk about. In a municipality that has adopted bylaws that comply with subdivision one of this subsection B, deeds may not be restricted by covenants, conditions, or restrictions that conflict with the duly adopted municipal bylaws or policies. This subsection shall not affect the enforceability of any existing deed restrictions. So this is another incentive I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more here in section three, but a municipality that adopts the bylaws that conform with the inclusive development provisions, uh, new deeds can't restrict, uh, new deeds cannot 
conflict with these inclusive development uh, policies. Um, and we add this language in uh, the next section to further clarify that. But this is um, private parties are not going to be able to uh, adopt uh, deed restrictions or covenants that will override the municipal bylaws related to inclusive development. Okay, so that's section two. So section three, 27 VSA section 545, covenants, conditions, and restrictions of substantial public interest. Deed restrictions, covenants, or similar binding agreements added after July 1, 2020 that prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting land development allowed under the municipal bylaws in a municipality that has adopted a bylaw in accordance with 24 VSA 4412B1 shall not be valid. So new deed restrictions covenants added after after this passes, not July 1, but after that, that conflict with the inclusive development provisions shall not be valid. And can we get an example of that, either from you or from, from John, um, Jacob? Sure, so um, a lot, so some of those provisions in 4412 really focus on density. Um, so like uh, the duplex one, so, a municipality that has water and sewer can't prevent duplexes. Um, a, a private party cannot add a restrictive covenant to their deed saying that this land will only ever be a single family dwelling, not a duplex. Because that would conflict with the inclusive development uh, bylaws. All right, thank you. Um, so, uh, so this section shall not affect the enforceability of any property interest held in whole or in part by a qualified organization or state agency uh, defined in 10 VSA 6301A, including restrictive easements such as conservation easements and historic preservation rights as defined in 10 VSA 822. So um, <clears throat> this is this language is we're not attempting to affect conservation easements that have been put on a property um, that are recognized <clears throat> under Title 10. And this section shall not affect the enforceability of any property interest that is restricted by a, a, a housing subsidy covenant as described in Section 610 of this title, held in holder in part by an, a party, by an eligible applicant as defined by 10 VSA 303 or the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. So, uh, so again, we're, we're talking about um, new restrictive deeds and covenants that are um, uh, created after this goes into effect. And we're not seeking to um, impact existing uh, conservation, or, or we're not seeking to impact conservation easements or um, the housing subsidy covenants with the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Representative Hanko. Thank you. Um, Representative Kalaki brought up earlier a housing development that's being built in South Burlington. And that this is just making me think that I need to ask this question. If after this law passes, um, a developer would like to develop a piece of land and um, establish covenants for buying homes in that development. And that's quite, that's been quite popular that um, folks buy homes in development specifically because there are some restrictive language, there is some restrictive language around what can and cannot be done in that development and some of it has to do with parking and some of it has to do with what the exterior of the homes look like. Does this affect a future 
housing, a future new housing development like that that could potentially be built? Yes, if the, if the restriction they were going to add conflicted with the, the four provisions of the inclusive development language. So there wasn't anything um, specifically about exteriors. There was some language about parking, but um, more about, um, you know, the language and in inclusive development has to do with rent leasing separately. So to some extent, potentially, um, if, if the deed was seeking to directly conflict to override the bylaw, it would override that restriction. Thank you. Can you just quickly point me to the, the page or the section with those four bylaws again, those four um, criteria? Yep, it's on page, it starts on page five and goes into page six. Thank you. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, and then section four, uh, report on substantial municipal constraints. So on or before January 15th, 2023, the department shall report back to the General Assembly on any substantial municipal constraint reports that they've received. The report on these reports shall address the number of municipalities that have reported substantial municipal constraints, the nature of the constraints, the impact on the development of housing in those municipalities, and any steps the department recommends towards reducing or eliminating constraints. All right, so that is the end of the municipal uh, zoning and inclusive bylaw stuff. Okay. Uh, Representative Kalaki. Thank you. Before we move on, I, I just want to make sure I understand maybe from uh, Josh uh, if, that you were talking about an opt out clause and isn't what well, we just went over an opt out clause for municipalities and what's missing in that from your perspective or Jacob, I, I don't know which person is the right person. Sure. Um... Representative Clackey, I'll address it first, and Jacob probably has more detail. But the opt-out provision is this municipal constraint report. You know that they would say we can't comply with this because, and the objection we heard is that um, the priorities um, given to those municipalities that are able to meet these um, new bylaw changes and not submit a constraint report, they'll have more access to funding and will um, you know, be, be favored in a way that a municipality that has to submit this constraint report and opt out um, will not be um, able to receive those funds in the same, in this, in the same uh, way. That, that's the concern. It, it doesn't necessarily say that um, they're, not, they're, they're no longer eligible for those funds. It just says that if you adopt these, you'll be given priority. So it's a... Uh, you know, if, if all things are equal and there isn't enough money, those that have adopted it will receive the funding before those that haven't. Okay, so so that would be an incentive, right? I mean, that's, yeah, got it, okay. Thank you. And this idea of priorities of, of, of municipalities that sign up for these kinds of programs or that follow these particular state-based rules. I mean, the, the, the elements of priorities is something that's common in the way that we do anything from downtown designation to any of the neighborhood programs. Is that right, Commissioner? That, that's correct. I mean, pr priorities are um, everywhere in all of our different funding programs. As carrots. As carrots. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, Ellen? Okay, so the next change is in section 11. Um, sections five through 10 were deleted. <clears throat> section 11, so this is, I think, could be considered a technical change. So we're in, we're, we're in Title 24, we're in the section that relates to uh, village center designations. And so, before, I'm sorry, before you go, before you go on, I'm sorry, just, just to be sorry. clear, the deleted sections were deleted from 
an earlier version of this bill. Yeah, it was a it was a floor amendment. So they um, it, yeah. the sections did not get renumbered because it was a floor amendment. So right, and so this is just this is this is information that I mean that we're not changing statute or any anything underlying. We're not deleting anything that's already in law. This is just language from the proposed bill as it was in the Senate. And the Senate process says that if it's a floor amendment, then we reflect it this way as opposed to what we would do in our committee. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, right, so village center designation. Um, so what we did on page 11 really was just consolidate all of the language into one reference. So village centers, are eligible for the following incentives and benefits. And we struck all of the language, but we didn't remove any of it. We made it into a more succinct statement. So they're eligible for the downtown and village center tax credit program in 32 VSA uh, 5930AA sequence. So that's just more of a condensing that happened. We're not we're not getting rid of any of these. They're just being condensed into this single reference. And then next, uh, we have a couple of sections related to tax credits. So in the, we're in the village center tax credit program now. So what we're doing in section 13 <clears throat> is we're adding neighborhood development areas to the uh, to areas eligible for qualified buildings under the his, the downtown and village center tax credit program so qualified build so buildings that would qualify for the tax credit um, currently can only be located in a downtown or village center and now we're adding neighborhood development areas um, to that also I'm sorry to jump in, but was there a definition of neighborhood development area that I missed? Oh, um, we haven't talked about it, but there are five designation programs that a municipality can apply for. They are designated downtown, village centers, and new town centers, as well as growth centers and neighborhood development areas. So uh, these are programs that you can apply to have your area designated in your municipality. Um, there is an entire statute that is um, not in this bill that lists the requirements as well as the incentives that, uh, uh, that one uh, town gets when they get this designation. Um, so this is, it's not here specifically, uh, but it is in statute and it's a pretty long standing program. And this is just adding another incentive that now if, you're, if your community has received its designation as a neighborhood development area, you can also qualify for this, um, this tax credit program. But only these three, designated downtown village center or neighborhood development area, not the other two that you mentioned. Correct. Thank you. And just as a time check, it is 1240. I'm this is the last, I have one more thing to touch on. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. Um, yeah, so we add neighborhood development area and then on page 13, we add the reference again, neighborhood development area. And then also on page 13, we add a new type of project that will be eligible for this tax credit program. So it's a a qualified flood mitigation project. So that means a combination of structural and non-structural changes to a building located within an area subject to the river corridor rule or within the flood hazard area as mapped by FEMA that reduces or eliminates flood damage to the building or its contents. The project shall comply with the municipality's adopted flood hazard or river corridor bylaw if applicable and a certificate of completion shall be submitted by a registered engineer, architect, qualified contractor, or qualified local official to the state board. 
improvements to qualified buildings listed or eligible for listing in the state or national historic register, <clears throat> uh, state or national register of historic places shall be consistent with the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation as determined by the Vermont Division of Historic Preservation. So uh, this section, we are, we are in this downtown and village center tax credit program. It's an established program. And now we're adding a new type of project that the tax that can receive this tax credit. So a qualified flood mitigation project uh, can now be eligible for a tax credit. And uh, that's it, because then the next, the last section I have is section 13A, and that adds the project. So it says flood mitigation tax credit. The qualified applicant of a qualified flood mitigation project shall be entitled upon approval of the state board to claim against the taxpayers state individual income tax, state corporate in income tax, or bank fr franchise or insurance premiums tax liability, a credit of 50% of a qualified of qualified expenditures up to a maximum of maximum tax credit of $75,000. Um, so this is a new tax credit available for flood mitigation. And okay. I'm not an expert in this. So any well, I, I was, was going to turn to Josh, um, to Commissioner Hanford and say, um, is this a kind of uh, tax credit or addition to this program that needs review by the Ways and Means Committee? Um, or does this fit under your existing budget for tax credits? This fits under our existing budget. It's, it's been in the works for, for a while and, you know, has been vetted by all the environmental communities and the, the river staff. And, you know, this is for existing properties. Um, you know, we're not going to be moving Barry. We're not going to be moving many of our historic downtowns that are in these flood prone areas. This is just allowing these private owners to access some of these tax credits to do some flood mitigation work and be eligible for, for, for this tax credit, um, in addition to all the other sort of eligible tax credit purposes. The previous um, expansion into the neighborhood development areas, that's one where um, Ways and Means and a few others have said, you know, that, that, that could be a rather large expansion of the program you know, so, you know, the program may need more resources, um, you know, so you're not, you're, you're already over, oversubscribed two to one, and now you're moving into to neighborhoods. Um, that's fair, but it's also fair that these neighborhood development areas are, are usually small rings around our historic downtowns and village centers. And, you know, those neighborhoods represent the housing stock and, and they should have access to these credits to, improve the housing stock, make accessory dwelling units, um, and that uh, we would, of course, like more resources to, to fund more projects, but it should be included. And right now, there's only six designated neighborhood development areas, maybe it's seven, but because there is really not much financial incentive for municipalities to go after that designation as it's designed now, once they have access to this tax credit and property owners realize there's some help for them to to reinvest in their properties, you know, make code improvements and and, and whatnot. They might, um, you know, encourage more municipalities to go through the, the effort of that designation process to allow their their property owners access to this resource. So in order to, in order to personalize this again um, to a degree, Randall Street in Waterbury at one point was considering. Uh, there was a there was an amount of money from FEMA available that would help uh, people lift their houses up, if, and it was a some you know, seventy five to twenty five match or something like that. But we're talking about a pretty serious chunk of change that it would have cost any of the individual homeowners to live. Is this the type of flood mitigation that project that may have that may have qualified for this tax credit? Whereas if I had to pay. Seventy-five thousand dollars for um, you know it, it, as my match uh, to to get my house lifted above the flood zone that that this would have given me a fifty percent um, tax credit. 
I, I believe so. And there's a lot of other less intrusive and less expensive measures, um, you know, for flood mitigation as well, you know, moving all the utilities up from the basement, um, you know, um, filling part of the basement, having gate, there's, there's lots of other things besides completely jacking up your home and, and adding sure. five feet to the foundation. But in, in general, yes. And Waterbury is a perfect example. Downtown Barry is a perfect example of, you know, historic neighborhoods that are in dangerous places and um, any help to the residents to, to mitigate those properties um, would be beneficial um, from just a pure expenditure of, of, you know, public resources go into fixing those properties when they're damaged anyways. Let's put the effort up front and give someone incentive to do this um, on their own um, is the thinking here. And it's, like I said, this has all been vetted with the environmental uh, community and the river corridors folks. This is not talking about building new in the floodway. Sure. If this is, yeah. We prefer to think potentially dangerous. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> the um, representative Triano. Um, so Josh, the, um, you may be familiar. There's a, a boarded up motel in Lindenville. Um, it would actually be likely be in, a, in, in what you just called a, a, a ring uh, around the downtown designation. Um, this building could probably house 30 or 40 uh, individuals, uh, but it is in, in the floodplain. And I, you know, I often ask why it, nothing was happening with this building, and that's what I was told. So would that sort of a, I mean, it's privately owned, so would that sort of a, a situation apply to this section? Would he be eligible, or the he or she, would the owner be eligible for some sort of uh, tax mitigation? You know, without knowing the specifics, I can't say for certain, but it, it sounds like it. If they were in one of these designated zones and they wanted to do flood mitigation work, you know, the other benefit that, you know, could, could be pursued is um, – the neighborhood designation area, if there's more housing that should be developed in that area, um, you know, some of the uh, regulatory, um, you know, Act 250 and others that, that come with, or we hope come with some of these um, uh, designations, you know, helps reduce the expenses to carry out a change of use like that. Say if it is a motel and they're changing it into permanent housing, you know, that's the sort of thing that usually triggers Act 250 and that if it was in a designated um, neighborhood development area uh, or downtown that was exempt from Act 250 um, for housing development, then that would be another advantage of, of these designations to reduce the development costs because you've gone through the proper planning and you have identified your needs and you're making this investment in the areas where we want the growth to happen anyway. So the benefits are you have less permits to get less, you know, pre-development work to prove that it's acceptable um, development pattern. So if I were to go to the Lindenville um, planning uh, office and uh, speak to them about it, that would give me some more information, I suppose, on what the designation is and what the possibility, it's a real eyesore. And it's really a shame that it can't be uh, used for something that uh, more. Yeah. Well, I mean, we can give you maps and show you, you know, um, all the different designation rings for Lindenville and see if it falls in something naturally. Um, we can send you our, you know, our, our um, designation map and our atlas that shows what's there now. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right. So, Alan, is the rest of this David's work? Is that is that where we are right now? Uh, yes, with one very small exception that I forgot on the very last page. So on the, the very last page, we have the effective dates, um, but we also have this implementation section. So um, incentives and funding established under 4412, so that's the, we have the incentives for the inclusive development, shall be immediately, uh, shall be available immediately to municipalities that adopt bylaws to comply with the inclusive development prior to the effective date. So the as you'll see below in the effective date, the inclusive development sections don't take effect until July 1, 2023. So they're pushed out three years, um, but municipalities that adopt bylaws to comply with them before then can have access to the incentives and uh, priority funding immediately. 
So the practical effect of this is to say to municipalities, you have two and a half years to uh, figure this out or to accept it the way that this is written. Um, any town or municipality that approves of it before then um, is allowed access, but basically the deadline is to accept these changes is 2023. Yes. So, <clears throat> so the the Senate sort sort of saw it as a a mixture of there is a mandatory this this program is mandatory, but for three years it's voluntary, and the sooner you comply, the sooner you have access to these incentives. But that that but that they need to comply with these. They need to figure out a way to make. According to this, they have to figure out a way to make their bylaws comply with statute before the twenty third. I mean, there's no there's no. So it's quasi voluntary or it's temporarily voluntary is what yeah. is what this bill is saying. And that and that one of the issues that was brought up by VLCT and by Commissioner Hanford is that. Um, is that being quasi voluntary isn't quite acceptable yet to for the whole bill? Um, so, um, all right, let's. I mean, committee, it's twelve fifty two. I want to end on time today. Um, are there any further? Um, so, first of all, thank you, Ellen. Um, thank you, Josh. Thank you, Jacob. I think we'll need your assistance in interpretation. Um, you know, I mean, we'll check, I'll have Ron check with them, Jacob in particular, but, um, in terms, if, if, if he's the primary, um, zoning interpreter, um, uh, for this bill, then, um, we'll keep checking with, with him, um, Jacob, with you, with your availability when we need you to take us through. Um, so my understanding is that for the most part, the, I'll, I'll just ask the administration, I'll ask other advocates later, but um, for the most part, the administration's main concerns are with section two um, and to be, to be partic in particular. I'll hesitate. That's correct. It's, I'll it's... hesitate on the Hamlet part of it. But, um, <laughs> um, so we will definitely, um, you know, keep an eye on that as we move forward with with our testimony on the bill. We will. Yeah, and just one other quick note. Um, you're right. It, it's mainly section two, particular B. Um, the uh, League of Cities and Towns and Planners ha have sort of let us know that the uh, accessory dwelling component of section two, they're generally in support of, support of. So there's nuances in, in this. There's, there's lots of this that people really like, but there's just a concern about the forcing of communities to do it. Because when this was first proposed, you know, and our department was the one working with everyone proposing this, there was money associated with this to help municipalities go through this process, do this work, sure. direct support that was stripped. And when that sort of happened, we, we really lost a lot of our, our partners um, in, in, in their support. And that, and that money was, and how much money was that? Oh, I think in total it was about 250,000. Um, Jacob would probably know offhand, but it was sort of, maybe Ellen knows directly offhand. And these were, and these were for planning grants, right? These were just they for- were, They were planning grants for both regional planning commissions to help small communities do this work um more municipal planning funding directly for these bylaw changes so it wasn't something they had to compete with themselves for other uh interests that communities had but to actually help them do this work um and so and this is money that this is money that would have come um let me guess from uh maybe the property transfer tax um, i can't recall to the I think municipal it was planning <laughs> portion of it um, i think it, it, i can't recall exactly if that was the the stream or no, not i i it's it's part and parcel of the largest conversation that we have in this committee about that about that tax um the municipal planners also get shorted uh, as well as yep. the housing um fund so all right um 
committee, any anything else before we head out for the day? Um, again, we have a 3.30 um, invitation to be a participatory, to have a joint hearing with appropriations. Um, I believe that's scheduled to be no more than an hour. Um, so if you are there, I mean, it would be nice to have a, um, a quorum there. Uh, if you, uh, if you can be there, that would be great. Um, and if we have to be so that if we have to vote on something, um, while we're meeting with appropriations, then we will, um, I'm going to hold off further conversation on the military portion of the budget until tomorrow. We'll, we'll review that again when, um, the folks from the guard are here. We are going to have to have a couple of different conversations with the guard and there's, there are, um, several topics that came up in the last two months, um, some of which is scheduled for tomorrow, but um, you know, there's the deployment, there's the um, scholarships, there's the um, discussion about the diversity officers ongoing still, um, but the guard would also like to share uh, access to some of the new hires that they made that they feel like handles some of the questions that were raised by the, by the diversity officer bill. Um, and uh, then there's a question that's come up from um, constituents of um, specifically of, of Representative Walls, but also across the state, just about the questions of the relationship between the Guard and um, the use of the military or special forces in, in um, quelling protests, as we saw in Portland earlier this year. Um, the guard would like an opportunity to um, also to address that as well, just to let us know and let Vermonters know what their standing is when it comes to um, how they're able to be used. Um, so, um, but that's going to be spread out over a couple of different meetings. We're not going to get to that in an hour and a half this week. So, um, not seeing anybody's hand up. Um, oh, are you saying goodbye, John? Or are you, are you raising your hand? No, I, I want people to know in the chat, Ron put in that the, the, the Zoom invitation for the 3.30 meeting hasn't come out yet. It's coming out at about three o'clock. So Teresa's going to send that later. So none of us have that Zoom link yet. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, and so Representative Hango, I just want to make sure that we I, you know acknowledge that there's still the question about all of section two. Um, but specifically with the sections that, you know, you're, again, you're more aware of than, than most of us are. Um, we will be hearing the list of witnesses on this bill in the Senate was pretty substantial. And I don't think we have time for 30 witnesses, but um, I think for this bill, again, there's, there's other things that, that will um, happen with this, but this, getting this section done and getting focusing on where the main concerns are is, is really what's next on this bill. So um, I'm sure that you'll remind us, uh, it, well, it, it's pretty simple. There's, there's section two, so we'll start with section two and go through that when, when we um, meet on this next. So thank you everybody, good to see you. And um, we'll see you at 3.30. Thanks.